All right. So we're getting really superstitious about what it actually takes. Like, so let's send energy toward the projector. So I wanted to talk a little bit today about this idea of exteroception, proprioception, interoception, but kind of from the inside out rather than the outside in. I'll kind of share with you this idea of what do we do in the body to get people to really inhabit their bodies. And so Norm and a lot of my colleagues have done these amazing presentations on the cognitive and scientific basis of proprioception and interoception, but let's look at what does it actually feel like in the body and what might it do for us from a clinical perspective. So what is this thing that we are inhabiting called the body? What are we supposed to do in this? And so we think about the body kind of automatically. We're just in it, we're here, we're living in it, but then what's going on in here and why is it so difficult to be embodied? in this society? What are the things happening that make it hard for us to inhabit our bodies? So the body is an important part of this network that's the mind, brain, and body network. So all these areas working in synergy. And we hear a lot here about the mind and the brain, and now we're doing exciting work. My colleagues are in the body. But how do they network with one another? And what's it like when they're working together in synergy? And this system is actually very sentient, it's intelligent, and it's interconnected. So this old idea we had that the mind is really evolved and then from the neck down, all of this is super primitive, it doesn't make sense anymore. We actually know that there's an incredible amount of sentient intelligence in the body. So I like to think about this continuum of embodiment and we have, starting on one side, what we might call dissociation. And then we have good movement or just being in our body and moving it in space. And then what we might call embodied awareness over on the right. What is it like to really inhabit and to work within the wisdom of this system? And uh, although it's not a one-to-one -one correlation, you could look at this continuum of interoception as kind of moving along with this idea of from gross to subtle. And, and so a lot of my passion is how do we take people from a gross awareness of where do I put myself in space so I'm not banging into doors or falling down and how do I create subtle awareness in my body? And so proprioception is really answering the question of where am I in space? Where is my body and you know, what do I need to put where if I'm in a movement or a yoga class? And interoception is really talking about, well, what's happening in this interior from one moment to the next? What's happening in my body? And so we can look at interoception as being kind of like <coughs> mindfulness expressed in the body. So what is it like to attend not to fixed sensations or sensations we predict that we're going to have, but what is it like to actually listen and feel into sensations in the body as they fluctuate, as they move? And that's often where we get stuck. It's not just a question of can we come into the body, but then what's happening when we're in there? And can we actually move off of sensation in the body? So it's really not easy being in this body. And yet, you know, um, we can see that Stephen Porges calls our embodiment and interoception is really our sixth sense. And by the way, we have a couple more seats up in the front if you guys want to be here. So it's not easy being at home in this body. And even without a history of trauma in the body, it's kind of scary to be in here. And um, I want to borrow some words from Norm. We've had a lot of interesting dialogues about the body. But Norm had this wonderful, wonderful metaphor, is that being in the body is like being in a wilderness. right? And this wilderness is always changing all the time in very unpredictable ways. And we don't know if it's going to be a foot of snow in this wilderness and we'll be wearing these kinds of shoes or whether it will be raining and we don't have an umbrella, whether we'll be prepared or not. And there's inherently in our bodies this incredible sense of vulnerability in the world. We know that we're not eternal, that something can happen to us at any time. And so in this wilderness, in this unpredictability, it kind of mirrors our emotional lives. So this idea of 
a lot of fluctuations of physical experience goes along with the fluctuations of emotional experience. And so part of my current interest is really examining the relationship between interoception and the body creating what you could call a sort of visceral reserve. And that visceral reserve being a direct parallel to emotional balance. And they're, they're really informing one another all of the time. And so the key things here are if you can have a momentary awareness, not a fixed awareness. So for example, in chronic pain, often we go in looking for that same pain. We can define it, we can predict how long it's going to last, we think we know what to do with it. So it's that momentary awareness and without any preconceptions of what we're going to find in the body when we do go in. And again, without fixing in one area. And that this visceral resilience when we're in the body and it feels like home is a direct parallel to emotional resilience. And so um, what kind of interoception do we want? Like, and here in America, we tend to do everything kind of with a hard edge. And so often when I work with people literally all over the world, it's like, I had a moment that I wasn't interocepting. Is that okay? And, you know, we think about being in the body not as a perfect ideal that we're going to be glued in here all the time, but that we're always dissociating a little. And I know that's a strong word, and it's the purview of us clinical psychologists, but we, in truth, we're always leaving our bodies. And the question is, can we notice when we've left? And can we bring ourselves back in, in just a very kind and grounded way? So looking at how do we teach that to people instead of holding up this ideal of I'm going to be in my body perfectly all of the time. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of difficult interoception. So, and I apologize that we can't see all of these slides. We can start to look at some of the emotional issues we talk about, anxiety, depression, chronic pain, even irritable bowel syndrome and other disorders of the gut or the enteric nervous system and other addictions like eating disorders, um, we think of them sometimes as biochemical issues. And there's some correlation, of course, but I've come to understand these as living on a continuum of interoceptive disorders. And each of these has sort of what we would call in clinical terms, funky interoception. So um, some examples of that with eating disorders is that obese people tend to underestimate their weight. They don't have a true sense of how um, large they might be or can they fit into a doorway. And that sounds strange, but when you think about proprioception even, we, we know that we can fit through a narrow space and that helps us to not bang into doors, but often people are missing that sense. And people with uh, anorexia can tend to overestimate their weight. Um, and a lot of the research has shown that people with higher interoception, particularly women that can inhabit their bodies better, tend to have a higher body image. So if we start to kind of look at this continuum of energy, we start to look at interoceptive disorders as issues where we have a lack of cohesive sense of the body. There's not an internal cohesion and our body maps are off. Um, and it turns out that that's true in a lot of clinical syndromes and particularly in post-traumatic stress disorder or whenever we've had a certain kind of trauma. So one of the things that we can acknowledge is that having a history of trauma of any kind, it makes it really difficult to inhabit this body. The wilderness of the body becomes a really scary place. But also being, not being in this body is itself a form of trauma. And so when we start to think about ourselves as having learned to not be in our bodies, there's a sense of trauma that comes with that. And I've been exploring some of the research in pain and other issues and starting to find some interesting connections with a lack of interoceptive awareness and pain and trauma. And so one of the interesting things is in looking at people that have uh, thoracolumbar spine pain, you would expect to see that certain receptors are, are firing a lot, right? They're over firing. And in fact, what we're starting to, to see is that when they go in to actually measure the firing, nothing's happening. Those receptors have been killed off. 
So then you might wonder with that, you would expect to see lots of activity, there's not a lot of activity. And one of the things that can happen is when we don't go into our body, when we don't have interoception, um, what can happen is that we, the brain looks for this body map that we all have, doesn't find anything there. And then the sensation of pain is actually coming as sort of a call, thanks Jiro, a call into the body. And it's like, you know, Joseph Campbell talked about a call to awakening on our journey, but pain is signaling, come in and start to reform that body map, start to sort of stitch it back together. Um, and so we, how do we work with this idea that dissociation is a survival tactic? And that's true for a lot of us really not any longer an expression of pathology. And when I was a young psychologist, which is a, several decades ago now, I worked in an inpatient setting in a psychiatric hospital on the only uh, self-injury unit, contained unit, um, that we had in the country at the time. And we used to talk a lot symbolically about self-injury, and I've come to understand it a little bit differently, that yes, um, cutting the body and seeing it bleed and sort of feeling pain is, is sort of a way of coming in, but I think in, in many ways, like the people with spine pain, um, cutting the body is a way of creating a new body map, of trying to come in and reestablish those lost visceral connections. And there are many ways that we try to do that. So you can be thinking as we're talking together about what is your call to awakening? And so a lot of the people I work with come to me because something has been injured or they have a surgery and it's a very upsetting, you know, this idea that we think of our body as fixed in time and space. So this is how I look when I'm wearing a dress, this is my size, this is how healthy I am. We don't expect that to change. And fixing the body in one spot is sort of a response to this idea that it really is a wilderness in here, that it's very hard to inhabit it. So again, how do we come back to teaching people how to be present with sensation as it moves in the body? Um, and then phantom limb pain we can also understand in the same way. The limb is gone, but the pain sensation is there. And part of that pain may well be a response to a missing part of our body map, that interoceptive cells and tissues have been destroyed, and the body is kind of crying out in pain that's not only physical, but also very emotional and very psychic. So the sensation of not having things wired into the body is traumatic. Um, and some interesting research on aging, I don't know if you have seen some of the studies looking at, we used to think that aging led to muscle loss, and some recent studies coming out saying that it's actually the reverse, that muscle loss causes aging, and I think it'll be a matter of time before we start to hear more about loss of connective tissue in addition to muscle. So looking at muscle and tissue as sort of an interacting, ongoing system. Um, I've been playing a little, and, and I feel sort of part in this play, with this idea that the body has several hot spots for dissociation, but those can also be turned into hot spots for mindfulness and interoception. And so looking at some of those spots, they would be the feet, the abdomen and pelvis, the heart area and upper spine, and then the throat, jaw, and cervical spine. And you can think of this upper area here as kind of a bridge between the mind and the body. And in many ways, it's like our second pelvis. So we, we have um, a, lot of, a lot of help standing upright down here, and we think of hip openers all the time but starting to think about this mind-body bridge as another sort of pelvic area. And I've been, I've been engaged in some really exciting interdisciplinary dialogue lately with a lot of fascial research people who are talking about these very areas are places that promote the tone of the vagus nerve. That's our primary sort of parasympathetic communicator and that there are many more sort of afferent receptors for interoception in these areas. So that's been really cool to have these dialogues. Um, and actually much of what you're hearing today, and I love the way this sort of mirrors that, is that 
all of these talks that have happened. And even this week, I was talking with two people, one of whom does at Harvard research on fascia, and it's totally sent me down a rabbit hole and kind of disorganized everything. And um, I think in six months, if we meet again, um, I'll have even more to say about some of these connections. So I'm um, looking at this occipital area, and I thought it would be nice just to say hello to this space together. We don't have to do anything huge. But then in doing that, I want to give you a little bit of an idea about this thing that I call the yoga practice laboratory. So we've seen this weekend a tremendous amount of really engaging science and experiments. And there's no reason why we can't sort of enter this field of the body in a similar way. So I thought we could take a moment in much the same way that we did a little work in our bodies in the beginning and just look at these. And these are some baseline measurements. And you could certainly ask people to look at anything that seemed relevant to them. So before we go in, let's just let the eyes softly close. And then sometimes when the nervous system is really activated, we can close our eyes. But then the eyeballs remain very active. So really starting to learn how do we turn down a little bit our visual cortex and turn up the intelligence of the body. And then just beginning to breathe in and out through your nose here. And as you continue to breathe, just asking the first baseline measurement, am I in my body right now? Or to what degree am I in my body? And then sensing also physical energy level, the speed of the mind, how fast are the channels of the mind changing. If you have a sense of your nervous system wiring, if you're able to feel into that, getting that as well. Any depth of breath, sort of pain issues that might be happening there. And even emotional tone. And when you have that sense, just take the middle fingers of each hand and touch them together. Just feel that connection between the finger pads, maybe the ring fingers as well. And then slowly bring those behind your head and right at the juncture where the neck and the head meet, just meeting the middle fingers together. And then beginning to palpate there a little bit, noticing if there's tension and tightness. And you certainly can move your head around a little bit within that tension. And then starting to travel slowly out toward the ears. And as you travel, you'll find these two little divots or indentations in the body, not, not being worried about getting the wrong place. Easier to find sometimes when the chin is parallel to the mat. And then just giving yourself a little bit of traction there. Just gentle lift of the occiput and maybe a little bit of circular movement of the head, letting the chin dip. So we're going in to work a little bit with the craniosacral juncture here. And we have a lot of lymph back here as well. And then noticing, am I, am I thinking, am I getting this right? What am I supposed to be feeling? I better look at Bo because she'll know and I'll be able to tell if I look at her. So to what extent are we allowing our visual cortex to take over, which it will try to do, and the mind will narrate your experience. It'll say, I've got this. You've got nothing on me. I'll tell you what to look for and what to find. So just allowing yourself to really drop into that intelligence of the body And then when this feels complete to your body, slowly releasing and letting the hands come down for a moment. And then we'll take another baseline, looking in again and just getting a sense of, am I in my body any differently than I was just a couple of minutes ago? And then what's the speed of my mind, that channel changing? Did it adjust at all? The depth of breath and then anything else you notice in your interior. And when you're ready, slowly transition your eyes to open. 
And then just what did you notice? And just making a, a note to yourself. And again, looking at that idea that often we're taught to go into the body using the mind. And how do we notice when those things are happening? And, and that, that impulse, and, and you had that, and we connected over that, to look at me and see what I'm doing so that you know that you're getting it right. So that little mind-brain-body connection happening here. And then allowing it to be okay if you don't know what you feel in there. That often is what happens when we first learn to interoceptive. Um, and we want to know that our brain learns from new experience. And so beginning to apply this to interoception as well, that we want to take people into new areas or lead them in in new ways. And you can feel like a loser in the beginning of that process and sometimes part way through. And I think part of the difficulty that we have being more embodied is that we have been raised to really value mastery and to be able to know how to be in the body, to be able to execute positions. And yoga hasn't helped with this in our traditional yoga world, because what you see in, in the social media surrounding yoga is beautiful postures, aware and graceful bodies. Um, but mastery is the opposite of mindfulness. It's the opposite of interoception. And so having no mastery as we enter the body, I think even for someone that's been teaching for a long time, tremendously important to create new neural pathways. So what helps us enter the body? How do we get in there? And what are some tools or techniques if you teach or work with populations of people that you want to be able to bring into your body? And um, there's a way to sort of evaluate the amount of interoceptive awareness that there is in movement. And I've been playing a little bit with this scale and would love to get your feedback. Um, and so uh, this concept of anchors for interoception, that instead of saying, well, go on in there and just hang out and stay until something happens, but that as we bring people into the body, particularly when body maps are a little bit blind, we want to be able to anchor awareness, to give it a place to sit and to feel contained. So think of this as building a frame around interoceptive experience. Um, and also transitioning from the gross awareness or proprioceptive awareness, which is very important, to a more subtle awareness. And that's more close to interoception. So one of the primary ways that I do this is to sort of turn down people's visual cortex. So I don't do as much modeling as I used to of poses and showing people how to do it. I really ask them to go in and feel. And then instruction actually gets to really grow and develop from that point. And you'll sort of know when you play with language with people, you'll get to see them receiving language rather than a visual cue that then becomes performance or mastery based. Um, and then using this practice lab model to say, is there a difference between before and after? Um, as a psychologist, I've played with language for 25 years. And if I say, well, how did that feel? What are you going to say to me? I think I got it wrong. You, you think <laughs> you got it wrong. And what will you say if I say, how was that? I was happy. You were happy. <laughs> it was great. I'm amazing, right? So really lear <laughs> learning to language to the experience of the person and giving them those baseline measurements that we just practiced. And then I use this a lot. And actually, this is something that I took for granted until I was teaching in Tel Aviv last November. And I'm about to go there again. And because of a little bit of language barrier, I just brought them through experience without saying what I was going to do. And then I said, well, what did you notice? And they all said that um, they never had placed their hands on their own body so much and that it really helped to ground them. And recently, I was in North Carolina, and I was really moved to hear people say that there's something about putting their hands on their body that makes them feel more engaged with me as somebody co-leading a practice with them. And that when their hands aren't in their body, they hear just instructions that they're meant to perform at. So you can start to get interesting feedback in using these interoceptive anchors with people. And then slow movement so that people can feel what are the movement patterns that we engage in. And then there's something that I'd like to call regenerative movement. Um, and getting back to that idea that connective tissue loss and muscle loss may actually initiate or accelerate the aging process. 
when we think about movement and we look around at this room, so we're on a smooth carpeted surface, no feedback in here at all. You can't even on these chairs sort of play with the rung on the chair in front of you. That's just not comfortable to do that. And then looking at the surfaces we have in our homes and environments, everything you need to make dinner is laid out in front of you at just the right height. So in a lot of ways, we can think about ourselves as using adaptive technology all the time. And instead of helping with a disability, we're actually promoting disability through this technology. And um, I, I've noticed in myself, and I've had, I, I'm hypermobile, I've had a few hip surgeries, and in the last surgery, there was some damage done. So I got to study in my body from surgical error what happened when the interoceptive map was eroded a little bit. And in addition to feeling a, a real emotional sense of betrayal and panic, and then I was talking with Norm about this, I was really fixing sensation every day, predicting what I would find, going in after it, finding it, and then saying nothing has changed. Um, and what I also noticed um, quite a while after that is that in my own practice, I started to restrict movement. I did only the things that felt safe or that I could do and didn't feel as awkward doing, almost as sort of a, a comfort mechanism, as a s sort of soothing way of moving. And I was in the gym the other day watching myself, and I, I have to do um, some things like jumping. And uh, I, I work with athletes a lot, and I was working with a baseball player, and we were outside, and I would leap to make a catch with the glove, and my arms would go, but the legs would stay. And this happened again and again. So. I knew that I needed to jump and of course I got into the gym and I had this very low bench and I went over to the bench and I was resolving to jump and I looked around to see if anyone was watching because I didn't want to look like a loser and then I looked and I could feel my body map saying you can't do that and I walked away and so that told me like such a powerful response in my body to injury and to the, this loss of, I think it works, it likes it when I walk over here, <laughs> to the loss of body map. So how do we create novel movement in our lives? Because we really are like animals in captivity. Um, even something like preparing your dinner on the floor, you're sitting on the floor and you're moving around, which could look like fidgeting, right? But is actually very good for your body. So how do we make movements that we don't normally wake and make and sort of increase this movement repertoire? Um, another thing in movement is to pay attention to the transitions from one pose to the next because we really value being in one spot. And so you can actually visually see during a transition, say from downward dog to lunge, and I write about this a lot, that in that transition, interoceptive awareness goes down and then kind of dials back in when people arrive in lunge. So by kind of drawing out those transitions in a practice, you can really help people connect inward. And by losing momentum, and what I mean by that is using sort of momentum of movement to get ourselves into a pose, but rather really feeling like, what's initiating movement? How can I spread out where I'm localizing internal sensation? How can I grow my map bigger? And even the way that we're sitting now, we could just initiate a few sort of expand into somebody else's space sometimes. Well, what's the worst thing that can happen, right? They can give you a look. <laughs> um, the toggling technique is something that I use a lot, which is feel the difference between old way and new way. So if we take our hands back to our neck and then come into our sort of trauma response of turtleneck. So let's do it. This is not theoretical. <laughs> but feeling what does it create in the body and in the mind to sort of crunch that area and that's sort of a startle response. So we can really watch what happens to heart rate. And then what's the difference when we do what we did in the beginning and really lengthen and elevate that area? And then looking again in movement, I was really excited to find, this is actually last night. Um, I'm kind of a geek and I like to keep reading uh, till the last minute, but we use a lot of isometrics for sensation and embodiment. But I also discovered that isometrics facilitate the hydration of connective tissue in, in a very big way. Um, and then the language of interoception. And this may sound like a strange thing to be talking about. Norm actually inspired this a year and a half ago because he was telling me that you can actually analyze 
language of, of mindfulness or interoception kind of look at the occurrence of certain words. And when I look at the patterns of how a lot of teachers teach, it's really action-based. Put your arm here, put your leg here. And then if you have time and you're not moving too fast, all right, well, breathe. That's all that's said, right? <laughs> and then if you really have a lot of time after that, you can, you can say, well, notice this or notice that. But with the language of interoception, not only do we sort of anthropomorphize the body and talk to it as though it's actually a sentient, intelligent thing, which it is, but we language more to awareness than action. So you can see if you look on the left over here, this idea that you use awareness to lead into movement and breath after that. And action is often the last thing, sort of the tip of that pyramid. Um, and I think it would be really cool to study. I'm always coming up with ideas for Norm to look at, um, to look at how often is the language in a class based on awareness rather than action. Um, and so we're looking also perhaps at something that lives maybe beyond interoception. We're aware not just of the sensations in the body, but perhaps of this idea of intelligence that dwells beyond the body. Um, and we don't have a ton of time left, but I wanted to point out that it's maybe not the method that we use, but the quality and degree of interoceptive awareness that really count. And I was very moved yesterday to uh, attend one of the concurrent sessions that John did um, with Dave Vago and Dave and Julianne, where they were highlighting a teacher that used mindfulness in the schools. And what kept coming up again and again is, this was not a protocol. Um, it was actually the embodiment of mindfulness in teaching. And so I know that it's so important for us to be evidence-based at, at the moment, but I wanted us also not to really discount our own intelligence. And so to really look at what does it mean to actually take the principles we're talking about and embody them in our teaching. And what a lot of the connective tissue researchers talk about is that we can actually create happy tissue happy connective tissue, and our tissue and other people's tissue is communicating. Dan Goldman, if you were here, would probably pass out to hear that, but there is a sort of sense of a visceral contagion, you know, that we have all the time with people. If you've ever sort of talked with someone with chronic pain, it's not just an emotional tone you get from them, it's really a sense of tight tissue and guarding of the body that communicates itself to us, that creates this contagious response. Um, so what are some rich areas to look at to interocept? Um, I'll, I'll give you three that I've been playing with recently. Um, and those are, are what I consider bodies in the mind-body network. So we have pain, modulation pathways, we have um, immune system. But these three over here, the autonomic nervous system, the enteric nervous system, or our belly brain, and our connective tissue matrix, all work in synergy. And so some of the tools to balance our nervous system, which is like this in our, our modern society and very, very overstimulated, um, like this guard dog, is that we look at what are tools for vagal tone. And one of my favorite tools is restorative yoga, which is really like an embodied meditation. So you're doing a meditation in the body, and I've, I've observed this for about 12 years in our clinics and teaching laboratories, as I like to call them and really looked at how it's this combination of ease in the physical body, you know, our degree of relaxation, the mind actually sort of coming into the body and nervous system balance, where the head is at or below the level of the heart, and um, we have that sort of reduction in heart rate. This allows the mind to become very exquisitely aware to what's happening in the body. And then we get to decide how long do we want to stay there. So it's not a forced thing at all. I worked with um, several bipolar people, and often what will happen is they go in, and they can tolerate about two minutes in there, and then sensation becomes really strong, and they need to get out. So permission to sort of titrate the amount of awareness that's happening at any given time. I keep highlighting, have you noticed, the clinical observations are all announced. And so in a science-based uh, symposium, this is like a warning sign. It's like a big red road sign. 
Um, <clears throat> so here's a picture on the left of restorative yoga, and you can use eye pillows, and which actually stimulate the oculocardiac reflex, light pressure on the eyeballs, and that slows the heart. And then we've actually put weight on the abdomen, and I was really delighted to find, and I have some people that have actually trained with me. Um, I was just reading from some connective tissue researchers that that actually stimulates vagal tone. So it's kind of fun to see how that intersects. And then looking at the mind in restorative yoga, um, when the body is at rest, it's not a passive practice. We, we sort of promote something that's called constructive internal reflection when the body is at rest and the mind is not asleep, but rather really able to observe these fluctuations in the body. Um, and then just one little bit on the enteric nervous system. It has a hundred million neurons in this belly brain, which is more than the spinal cord contains. And not only that, but it's really wired for mood. So we have actually, when you think of serotonin, you think of some, what do you think of? Happy, yeah, mood. And where is it made? It's in the brain, and then it, it kind of goes around in the brain, and it has to reach the right place. Well, our enteric nervous system has not just one, but seven different kinds of receptors for serotonin. And for a long time since Michael Gershon's amazing book, The, the Second Brain, which I think was 98 or 99, nothing happened for quite a while. And then suddenly, the last couple of years, there's been an explosion of research. And so um, let's take you guys, for example. What's your name? Magdalena. Magdalena, oh yes, we met yesterday. And then you are? Miles. Miles. Now you guys look pretty mellow, so this is not personal. But let's say Magdalena is very dynamic, kind of anxious mouse, and Miles is a mellow mouse. So they said, what would happen if we took the flora, just the bacteria in Magdalena's gut microbiome, and we put them in Miles? Miles suddenly becomes anxious. And they said, I wonder if the reverse is true. And they took Miles' kind of mellow gut microflora and put them in Magdalena, and she becomes a mellow mouse. And the researchers went one step further, and they cut the vagus nerve and found that that effect completely disappeared. So we now think that the vagus nerve and vagal tone is one of the primary ways by which our gut communicates with our brain. And one of the exciting things to me is to notice that where we're just about to go for a couple of minutes into the connective tissue matrix, um, when you do work in that matrix in a mindful way, our digestive system responds. So there's some really cool ways of working in the body. So this connective tissue matrix, just a few fascinating things here. The fascia has 10 times more sensory nerve endings than muscle and it literally links every cell in your body. So not only is it this biological structure, but it's our internal model for interconnectedness, for cohesion. It's like a social model within our bodies. It's physical and it's neurological, very emotional and very sentient, this matrix, and intelligent. And so um, there's this new sort of area of study called fascial plasticity. And some of the really kind of cool, exciting, geeky things that I've found include looking at the, the <coughs> sort of quality of touch with which we approach this system and using force that creates kind of a sheer force on the body actually leads to the death of connective tissue. And then when we stretch it in a certain way, it promotes tissue cohesiveness. So instead of thinking I've got to go in and make everything open <coughs> up, really looking at how do I talk to my tissue? What does it need to hear? And I've, I've had the really great honor of working with a lot of people in rehab. Some of the language of having surgery is so compelling to me and has opened a lot of doorways into this idea that you know my tissue is not communicating or there's congestion in this site. Messages aren't traveling. And I'm starting to look at this idea of different kinds of work for different kinds of, of injuries. Um, fascia is made of fibrin, elastin, reticulin, and then snot. So it's very gluey, it's very mucousy, it's super fluid, and it communicates through the nervous system, but also to the vibration of neural impulses in water. So we want to be thinking not about, can I make myself more open, more flexible, but what would it be like to create happy tissue? And happy tissue is tissue that's hydrated and communicating really well. 
so tissue resilience. And there is um, evidence for connective tissue as a substrate for interoception. So I've just kind of given you a few slides here that interstitial receptors in our connective tissue are responsible for the majority of sensory input. And um, that's interesting. <laughs> and they've now been linked with the autonomic nervous system and also vagal tone. 40% of these actually respond better to light touch. And then they also follow this pathway, um, this complex pathway of the spinothalamic tract, which Norm outlined for interoception. So a lot of fascial researchers are now saying that our interstitial receptors are, they represent, and they actually are the vehicle for interoceptive intelligence. So as we move our bodies in yoga, are we talking to connective tissue? These carry seven times the amount of information for interoception as they do for proprioception. So it's really kind of cool to see. And um, although, okay, there we go. And so just, um, I'll give these in your, in your handouts, but interoception and fascial receptors, emotional intelligence, and self-recognition. That's the name of a recent article by Robert Schleip. And then fascial um, mechanoreceptors and their role in tissue man manipulation. And so it's really cool to see that if we just had more interdisciplinary dialogue, we would be able to inform our movement practices really, really well. So um, just keeping in mind, and we've said a lot of this already, how do we activate these interoceptive fibers and enter this field of connective tissue with really subtle work? Um, and then I wanted to also talk about these as our models for interdependence. And so we can even look at this idea of here we all are together, creating dialogue. And so um, Mind and Life has this idea that, that we have our, our mind, and if you train the mind, you can impact the brain and body. And I love that recognition of this interdependence between those three areas. And I also feel that we could expand that, that if we work mindfully and interoceptively in the body, we can also influence the mind and brain. Um, and so looking at how do we ignite consciousness and really move from mental insight to embodied gnosis or embodied awareness? What are the steps by which we can do that? Um, so I really, I wanted to kind of think about this idea that the smartest tool we have may be the intelligence of our own bodies. And what would it be like to live from that space? Um, and we have our own sort of bioavailable technology, our resource for transformation, looking at the body as a vehicle to enlightenment and all of the bodies we come into contact with. Neuroplasticity isn't just an individual dynamic, but really a social construct. How do we move in a smart way? How do we inhabit our bodies? And how do we be in our bodies with intelligence together? And so this technology that we have inside us is teeming with life and teeming with intelligence and vibrant energy. So let's enter this mind-brain-body network together and kind of see what we can find. And I really, uh, I was looking at, at poetry and looking at Hafiz recently and also Dr. Seuss. So <laughs> in one of my favorite books, Oh, The Places You'll Go, Dr. Seuss writes, you have brains in your head, you have feet, in your shoes, really interesting. You can steer yourself in any direction you choose. Just in case any of you are here thinking it's too late for me to be in my own body, I wanna show you my first uh, yoga therapy client. This is my dad um, at the age of 86 there practicing. And uh, he was one of my best teachers about this connection with the autonomic nervous system. So it's never too late. And as Hafiz says, you carry the ingredients in you to turn your existence into joy. Mix them. So I want to thank you for taking this journey with me and sitting patiently. Thank you.